And um, let's see, does anybody see me yet? Do you, can you see me? I can't see me, so I don't know. Yes, I can see you. Oh, good. I'm here. How about the how about the League of Women Voters here? So the um, I'd like to. Um, <laughs> we figured something. I figured out something. Okay. So we have 29 people right, right now. Excellent. All right, I'm going to begin and welcome everybody to the League of Women Voters. Um, meeting on diversity, equity, and uh, inclusiveness. Um, I'm Margie Gray. I'm the coordinator of the leadership team. We have 10 awesome members of our leadership team. Uh, we currently have 113 members, and we encourage all of you new members to um, reach out so we can know who you are. We'd like that, and we encourage other people to join the league. We're men and women only, so we're inclusive that way. So that's good. Um, the sign behind me says that, you know, the league was 100 years old last year, so this February 14th will be our 101st birthday. Um, if you have questions about the league, Karen Dills is uh, here today. Um, after the meeting, uh, when we finish, uh, Wendell finishes his presentation, if anybody wants to stay on and ask uh, some more questions about the league or some other questions to Wendell, we're happy to do that. So let me begin. And so... Um, Let's spotlight Wendell. We'd like to welcome Wendell Pryor, who is the Executive Director of the Economic Development Council. And um, we had published his uh, uh, biography, or his, uh, not really a biography, his background and all of his qualifications in both our newsletter and on our website. So, um, this is an important topic. The League of Women Voters at the national level and at the state level have uh, advocated uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just as a policy, but as a practice. And uh, living here in Chafee County, we wanna learn more about that. And Wendell's background gives us that information. So Wendell, welcome, and we'd like to spotlight you. And can you put some more light? You kind of are in the dark. For me? Let's yeah. See. Let me see here. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. Sorry yes. about that. All, no, right. all right. No problem. All okay. right. So let me. Would you like me to screen share too now? Um. Uh, not quite yet. You, you can get started on okay. it. Yeah, go ahead and screen share because as you're doing that, I want to uh, just preface a couple of things. First of all, I'm not doing this in my official capacity as the, uh, the executive director of the Economic Development Corporation. They have nothing to do with this. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm on my own, so to speak. Uh, but I wanted to be clear about that. Um, secondly, um, I hope you're either prepared to take notes or make some uh, mental kind of, uh, oh, conversations uh, with regard to what I'm about to say, because there's a lot of information and material and an hour doesn't do it justice. Typically I have a 40 hour graduate level contact course that I teach this uh, material over. So you're gonna get it in about an hour and it's an abbreviated version, but hopefully there'll be some follow-up that you'll be able to do. So before uh, we go to the uh, first uh, slide, I've got seven of them. Um, I wanna give you some background material uh, to uh, be aware of. And the first question that usually comes up is how did we get here? And I want to refer you to anything that you can find, any and all information on Bacon's Rebellion. If you Google it, you'll find that uh, the rebellion in 1676 was historic. Uh, in that it was the first revolt uh, before we actually became a country. But it's significant the more I studied it because it's the first time, number one, we started making um, the uh, distinctions with regard to race. And secondly, um, it has to do with uh, the fact that, um, you know, we've had this going on for a period of time. And, and uh, not only were we making distinctions about race, it helped justify conquering the Native American population 
and other populations around the country and even the world. So Bacon's Rebellion is kind of your frame of reference in terms of how we got here in this uh, conversation that we're about to have with regard to primarily race, but uh, also uh, equity. Secondly, let me give you a list of resources. These are resources and material that I've used throughout my work of over 20 years. Um, the first is, uh, you know, when we talk about diversity, uh, an author by the name of Trevor Wilson, who was an African Canadian, uh, started writing about this in the late 80s, and it had to do with how businesses were going to expand their market share to look into more markets around the world. And in order to do that, they had to understand um, what the climate was, uh, what values people had, et cetera. And that's where the whole concept of diversity as a business strategy came from. So people need to understand that diversity uh, primarily has been led uh, by the business community looking into different uh, markets, both in the United States and around the, the world. So Trevor Wilson uh, is one of the authors that I started following early on, and I've had a chance to meet him and talk with him about some of this work. Um, I am a protege of another author by the name of Ronald Takaki, who was a University of California Berkeley professor who established the first, first ethnic studies program in the 70s. So uh, I am a follower of Takaki. I've used his books and writings extensively and I've actually studied his works and hopefully in my spare time I'll be able to write more about him. But he started uh, compiling a compendium, compendium of articles around this whole question of diversity. And uh, the Debating Diversity, I think was his last uh, book and uh, that contains a number of articles that shed light on different uh, aspects of diversity and, and um, inclusiveness. And then finally, W.E.B. DeBoe is an author that you should know who was an African-American who wrote about slavery and Jim Crow and um, has some incredible uh, insights, for example, into the Civil War. And he's got a, an article especially uh, um, interesting to me about the paradoxical tragedy of Southern uh, voters during the Civil War uh, that uh, is a must read. But that uh, um, Takaki book contains the articles by DeBoe, but DeBoe is, an, is a is distinguished author in and of himself. And if we have a few minutes, I'm going to read an article from Sojourner Truth, um, who uh, I think captures the, oh, the the, the essence of what women can contribute to the civil rights movement and, and frankly to the current time as we celebrate our first uh, female uh, vice president. So with that, Margie, let's go ahead and kind of get into the first slide and we'll talk about diversity and equity inclusion. I wanna do, do the slides in about 20 to 25 minutes and then leave the rest of the time for questions. I've gotten a few questions already, but we'll try and maximize the time. So diversity, uh, as I learned when I was asked to teach this subject to an executive criminal justice uh, group. So I've taught for six years in the executive criminal justice program that the University of Colorado had, basically one of each police chiefs. Going back to 2002, right after 9-11, I started teaching FBI agents and ATF agents and wannabe sheriffs and police chiefs. I think I have probably a half dozen that are either current or former police chiefs and sheriffs around the state. So um, this question of diversity and, and the uh, answer there came from uh, the director of the program, Jerry Williams, who's the former police chief in Aurora. And he said, I asked him, what's his definition of diversity? And he said, basically any difference. And that's the one that I've run with in the way that we need to think about uh, the topic. The other uh, concepts that come up is the terms equality and equity. Um, and I wanted to just make this distinction quickly. Equality is typically defined as treating everyone the same and giving everyone access to the same opportunities akin or aligned to the women's movement. In other words, there's no reason that fundamentally we should not treat uh, women and men differently. And so there's an issue of equality there. Equity refers to proportional representation by race, class, and gender. And I wanna give you one more resource, and this is the most contemporary resource that I taught my last class 
uh, at CU Denver around. And the book is called The Hidden Rules of Race. And it really gets into the equity question by identifying about six different areas uh, where we really need to talk about structural racism. So when they refer to that term, the book, The Hidden Rules of Race, if you Google it, you can find it on Amazon, really goes in depth into the legal um, underpinnings of racism in our society in the different areas and what to do about it. So it ranges in, in topics from criminal justice to education and healthcare, you know, health equity with coronavirus is a, a big issue. Um, health and wealth accumulation and how that has basically uh, created some structural racism in some other areas. But that book is the most definitive book I've read regarding equity when we use that term equity. So we're talking about proportional representation. Probably one of the best examples is that uh, this whole issue around bias that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes has to do, for example, in a criminal justice context in, in terms of why African Americans who represent, let's say, 13% of the population are typically uh, more than half of the stops by law enforcement. And I tell people, you know, when I'm uh, speaking to my law enforcement groups, you know, stops is where the bad stuff happens. And, you know, George Floyd and uh, uh, his death and, and others are, is what we uh, want to talk about. But also, more importantly, to the point, we have a prison in Pena Vista. Why are a disproportional number of African Americans contained in our criminal justice system or our prison system, which we can no longer afford? I want to make that point. But that's what we're, that's what we're talking about when we're getting at um, equity. Uh, and then finally, inclusion refers to a culture and environmental feeling of belonging. And uh, we're going to have an exercise at the end to try and uh, uh, bring home that point. So next slide. So one of the things, and this is another resource coming up uh, that I think uh, helps uh, with the framework regarding um, this whole question of diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity is ethics. And there's an article that was shared uh, with me by a colleague uh, several years ago. And the title of the article, you can uh, Google it, is called, How Unethical Are You? And it's aimed at managers and supervisors and takes a different approach in terms of uh, ethics and uh, as an aspect of bias. It kind of introduces us to this whole concept of bias. And in the article, uh, it will take you to a survey that really is the underpinning of the research that's been done around bias. But I use it in my class, especially when I'm talking about managers, to really make the point that um, when we talk about this subject, there is an ethical uh, 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 version of it or an ethical aspect of it. So ethics is concerned with what's good for individuals and society and is also described as moral philosophy. And that's what I think we are. I think George Floyd's death had to do with our humanity and our moral philosophy and trying to rationalize you know, what was happening and why it's happened. So ethics is another aspect of, the, aspect of this. And, and read the article, How Unethical Are You? And it'll give you that overview of bias, which is something that we're coming to in just a second. So I've got a couple of quick um, one minute or so um, uh, uh, tapes that hopefully will be kind of funny. And then we'll come back and open it up for questions when I make some closing remarks. Cool. Let's see if we can get it pulled up. I'm working on it here. All I right. have it here. That's all right. We'll get and, there. Uh, I've got the um, I've got the one the second one pulled up. Well, we can do that. Can show the you, second one first. Sure. Let's. Okay, that's kind of related. This, yeah. This one down here. Yep. So is that all right to do that one now? Sure. I will do that one. All right. Did you want the slide before that? Uh, whatever works for you, Margie. Um, be flexible. They're it's kind of okay. funny and cute. Karen, go. Okay. Um, Karen, do you know where I? It's I can't find it on my screen. Sorry. That's all right. 
We're in good shape time-wise. What are you looking for, Margie? Uh, the, uh, oh, here it is. I found it now. Thank you. Now I have it. All right. Does that show up? You have bias, but there's nothing Wait. moving. Click on okay, the Okay, I need to stop. We're going to be fine. It's coming on my screen. Do you know if it's not on your screen? Do I stop sharing and do it again? I think you have to stop sharing this and go over to the screen where the video is playing. Okay. I think. Let me. It'll be worth the wait, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wendell. All right, let me stop share here. Fun. All right, and then I'm going to share and it is going to be right there. All right. Share that one. I can tell it's going to work because it's got the green screen around it. There you go. Here we go. We just need a little sound. Audio. Okay, let me pause it. I hear it. You're not hearing it? No. Nope. I'm not muted. Let's see. Um, when you when you share so, that application, there's a way to share the sound with it. So you might okay. have to go back and unshare this and then try to share it again and look for a click where you can share the sound. Okay, I've got the oh share sound. Thank you, whoever said that to me. It's at the bottom lower corner of the screen. I'm sharing it, I think. Hold shift to select multi, I don't want to show. I'm trying to, okay. Still not working. It started. No vo there's no sound. There's no sound. No sound? No yeah, sound. I hit the thing that said sound, so. All right. Okay. Um, That's OK. But one more time. All it's right. Share sound. We'll try it. And I've got the share sound at the bottom, and I'm sharing the window here. Please install Zoom audio device. To share your audio, please install a device. Oh dear. Okay, I think that's that's not gonna work. Sorry. That's okay. I can, can put that on. What we can do is put that we can put that on our website along with the video as a as a resource, okay? Along with yeah. the other things. So as we get to the next, it'll probably be the same way with the next one, Margie. Let's, so let me uh, see yeah. here. Okay, do one. On. Go ahead, because I can tell you what he basically says in over a minute, and that is all of us have bias. We all have bias, and I can uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what that is. We all have prejudice, and we all have discrimination. It's the ones that are hurtful that get us into the most trouble, uh, both legally and morally and ethically. And so that was the point that that particular... Um, uh, video was going to make. And then the other one having to do with microaggressions, I don't know if we can get that one. We probably won't. Um, Let's give it a try here. Okay. I've got share screen. I keep getting this. And maybe Karen can share it. I don't know. Or when? It keeps or asking. When will share it? Wendell, can you share it? Do you have it on your screen? I uh, hadn't pulled it up. Let's see what I'll have to do is um, go to, let's see, need to get out of this. It's asking me to install something yeah, on let's, my computer. Let's see if I can get it. Here we go. Let's see. And then you have to share your screen, right? 
Right. Let's see if I can. Uh... Now, am I sharing my screen? No. If if you make oh, Wendell's a host. Many times that I don't like the word bias because. Oh, it does. Bias is a bad oh, okay. Can hear it. I can't see your screen though. Okay. So make Wendell a co um, I have bias. You're going to make me the host? host? And then right. you can do it. Let's, I'm going to unhost me. Can I do that? Okay, Wendell, it doesn't give me make host. There it is. Okay, change host. All right. You're in charge, Wendell. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I'm admitting people. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you have to hit share screen oh, at the bottom. I've said many times that I don't oh, like the word boy. bias because bias has a bad name. Prejudice have, has a bad name. Stereotype has a bad name. In reality, that's what the unconscious mind does. So it's not something we that just bad people do. It's the way the unconscious mind works. And sometimes when we're talking to groups and people say, if you well, if you know have your yeah, from cursor at the bottom of where you you're me. seeing, there'll be a green thing that says share screen that you I have, have prejudice and stereotypes. Okay. And you're right, I don't know you, but that's not the point. The point I'm trying to Sharing make Sharing it on email, you know, Facebook, you, Reddit. There are many different Twitter. ways in which we categorize to say people are different. You know, I think hearing it is fine. And us, we also yeah, say hearing it is fine. They're not fully human. Yeah, let's just hear it. And it can be around race. It can be around disability. It can be around immigration. It can be around religion. We have all these ways in which we say, that person is not like me. That person is less than. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to go ahead and do the um, uh, one that I have here on. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Yeah. I'm going to do the one on microaggressions too and, and uh, let you uh, hear what that one is uh, about as well. And I think, you know, when you get a chance, we'll get these out to you. Um, you'll see um, how these are all just different uh, aspects of, you know, what it is we've been talking about. Let's see. And I'm fumbling, getting the wrong one pulled up. But let's see. Word documents. There we go. Bob went to PowerPoint. Okay. So we'll now go on and uh, do microaggressions. And this is a, a funny kind of cartoon. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> oh. Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while, no, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Do you see me shopping at so my I love share too. I'm getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. It seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try this challenging major. Ah, and other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. Okay, let's see. Okay, we're back. We're back. We're back. Never okay. left. 
Great. Anyway, uh, get those out to folks. I think you really uh, appreciate them uh, just in terms of another way of kind of uh, making the point. Um, so now I want to wrap up before I uh, give you all some homework to do, and then we get into the Q&A with this concept of the other and white privilege and uh, where that's uh, coming from. Um, so the other is an individual who's perceived by the group as not belonging. Again, going back to that whole concept of uh, inclusiveness as being different in some fundamental way, perceived as lacking essential characteristics possessed by the group, again, the majority group. The other is almost always seen as lesser or inferior being and is treated accordingly. And so you'll hear about this concept of the other is one of the thing that's, things that's kind of ingrained in our uh, culture. But when, when it comes to race and gender, that's where it becomes part of this vicious cycle. So I just wanted to introduce those concepts to you. The other one is white privilege or white skin privilege is the societal privilege that benefits white people over non-white people in some societies, particularly if they are otherwise under the same social, political, democratic, or economic circumstances. So again, those are on the slide. I, I don't mind Margie sharing that with folks so they have some uh, kind of frame of reference. So here's our homework to kind of get into this question of diversity and kind of end on this. I'll have some uh, closing comments at the end if we have time. But Margie, if you can go to the last slide and as we go to the last slide, everybody should take out a piece of paper and I tell my class to draw a circle on the piece of paper and draw the best circle that you possibly can. And so, uh, uh, Wendell, yes. Could you make me a host so I can share? Oh, that's right. That slide. Let's see, so <laughs> and do you want me to share it now or after they've made the circle? No, you can share it now. Let's see, how do I make the host? Okay. Uh, is that? Click on participants. Or there you go. And I'm going to make, okay. is, are you League of Women Voters co-host? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm a League of Women Voters. Yeah, there's two of us. Okay. I'm the first one, I make, think. Make the host. Yes. All right. You got it. But as you're drawing okay. that Thank circle you. and uh, Margie's kind of pulling it up, this is an exercise out of one of the other books that I teach uh, from uh, Taylor Cox and Ruby Beal are a couple of professors out of the University of Minnesota. And in my early work with diversity, uh, they wrote a book called Developing Competency to Manage Diversity. This is in the late uh, 90s. But uh, they had one exercise in there that stuck with me that I do in 15 minute to two hour to, you know, like I said, 40 hour presentations. And that's this. So pretend the circle is a pie and you wanna divide the pie into as many slices that represent your identity. And identity is important to understanding this whole concept of diversity and kind of understanding you know, the framework that you're gonna to use to come at it. So if I were looking at that um, circle and dividing it into slices that represent my identity, I would uh, put in there that I'm an African-American male. I'm proud of my heritage. I am a professor, I uh, am a father, a husband, grandfather, uh, Bronco fan, fly fishing fool, uh, basketball uh, junkie, et cetera. So those are the slices of the pie that represent my identity. So let me give you 60 seconds to try and uh, fill out as many slices of the pie as you possibly can. And then we can talk about those as we get into kind of the, the Q and A. Okay. So, and uh, I don't know if we're gonna have a time for any volunteers, Karen, you might be one of them or uh, Margie, but um, what, this tells us is how we identify ourselves. And the key point about it is this reflects the diversity within us, right? That's what we mean by diversity. It's any difference that we tend to honor as part of our personality or our identity. And when you start talking about those pieces of the pie, you can begin a conversation to see how much we have in common 
and how much we may be different. And, the, and, and what I tell uh, people, I'll use this illustration. When I'm in front of law enforcement and I'm talking to them about my experience as an African-American and I'm talking to them about how you might use this exercise and the training that we're going through is to begin to understand when you have somebody that you're gonna pull over and stop that you try and number one, be aware of your bias that you may have toward African-Americans and what uh, you may or may not have experienced and start thinking about what's in their pie so that we approach people not only in terms of our ethnicity or gender, but the multiple aspects of our personality that are really about our identity. Number one, we're much more interesting if we focus on that aspect of identity and in a lot of ways, and this is an exercise we utilize in going into organizations, we want to celebrate or highlight identities, right? So we want to know more about other people's culture because you're, you get your identity from your culture. And there are some other exercises that we go through in class to try and figure out you know, how those identities got formed. But typically, they are early in life, and especially around race and gender they happen in familial settings, so with the family. I don't know how many students I've had tell me when I do this exercise and we start talking about um, identity and culture and race and gender that they were either confused or embarrassed when a relative made a comment or a statement that they didn't quite get resolved. One of the most poignant is a young lady who was raised in Georgia and was taken to the golf course by her father uh, about every Saturday to play golf. And she never understood why she didn't see African-Americans or black people on the golf course. They were always, you know, in the restaurant, you know, serving people. And it wasn't until she had to confront that, you know, in my class that she realized that basically she was living in the segregated South at the time. And that's basically what we're going through is we have a lot of people who have unresolved issues as it relates to their identity that continues to get reinforced generation after generation. But if we focus on what's in our pie and what we have in common, we're much more likely to strike up a conversation with people that just from the outside, we will label them as long haired or hippies or uh, you know, African-Americans, black, Latino, Hispanic, et cetera, as opposed to under, trying to understand what's part of their makeup and their identity. So um, I've given you a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. And I think the best way to maybe go at this now, Margie and uh, Karen is to you know, deal with some of the questions that we have. And then I, we have time at the end. I just wanna wrap up with a couple of statements and then we're done. So let's, right. let's go Thank to the you. Q and A. Yes, and um, we have some questions that were submitted early. And then if anybody in the audience would like to submit questions, they can do it via the chat. And Karen and I will do our best to, um, to get those to you and read those. Already there's people are asking if we can have a, uh, if you will provide a list of the resources that you mentioned earlier. And I thought we could, post those on our website later that you can send us those, those books that you recommended as, sure. as a source. Yep. Um, so um, one of the questions is um, diversity, equity, and uh, uh, inclusion, D, uh, DEI. Is it a, a business only strategy or is it also an individual strategy? And I think you've kind of talked about this a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's a, it started out as a business strategy. That's where it started. For individuals, I think it's about getting in touch with one's identity and being reflective in terms of where those identities came from and recognizing that we all have different and interesting uh, identities. This is where we just need to be curious. You know, um, we have an incredible society that should be celebrating diversity and does to a large extent, but we should be curious about other people's identities and where they've come from. Okay, um, we had a question as an organization. Um, we've been asked to, when we have people sign on to uh, sign up, that we should ask them their uh, race, gender, birth year, ethnicity, um, 
other data like that. And do you think that's appropriate? I mean, they're trying to get um, a record of diversity within the organizations, but do you think that's uh, appropriate for organizations to ask members for their birth year, race, ethnicity, um, and gender? Under so here, here's kind of my answer to that question. I, I, you know, the question is becoming more diverse to do what? So I would start with the population demographics that you're serving and see if your board is reflective of that. In other words, does it mirror the population? And then, um, then go back to the first question, to do what? So the request should be strictly voluntary, number one. And you have to be able, in my mind, to the answer the question for what, and then so what? So what, it, so what why are you collecting the information? You know, and, and um, at the board and leadership level is where I would start. And so just do the population demographics for Chafee County. Does your board reflect those demographics? You know, we've got, um, I think, don't quote me on the numbers, uh, uh, Latino population here of around, I think, five or six percent. It could be higher. And I know the African-American population, you know, is, is around one percent. But there are other diversities, you know, uh, within that. But I would start there. But then the question is, what are you going to do with that? And why do you want? Um, um, and what do you want to do about it? Is my question. But we there's been a lot of work, probably going back ten or fifteen years, to have the boards of organizations, especially nonprofits, be reflective of the communities that they serve. So in the San Luis Valley, the League of Women Voters board ought to look a lot different than it does in Chafee County if that makes any okay. sense, or Thank even you. Lake County. Yeah, okay. Um, and that being, talking about our county, a question says, how does a very homogeneous county like ours try to learn more about being inclusive in the plight of our of races and ethnicities? And what diverse groups are there in Chafee County? And you've mentioned a couple. And what problems do all or some of these groups face within the county? So we see age as, a, as, a, as an issue. Yeah. Uh, in the county that um, we don't have a lot of younger members um, in, but I don't think that's a problem with a lot of organizations too. Um, so what other diverse groups or what other groups are there in the county that, that we should be looking into reflecting? Well, I think uh, the school districts have an interesting uh, demographic pro profile and um, I would talk with the school districts about what uh, some of the, how, how diverse are they? Because I think the general population, you tend to not see it, but I think the schools are frankly becoming more uh, diverse. I know they are. And so um, I would be approaching them and asking how we can support, you know, their diversity efforts because they've got to be teaching it, you know, in, in some way or another. And uh, that would be, I think, one place where you'd see more diversity than you might see or be reflected in the general population and, and how we can support and help there because we're living in a diverse society. The big you know, uh, point that a lot of the national news makes about you know, people feeling threatened is that the projection, and it's probably gonna come true, is by 2030 or 2035, there will no longer be a majority race in America. We will all be majority minority. And, you know, for people that feel threatened about that, and I, I make this, I, I, you know, I want to make light of what's happening because it's so serious is, you know, we started about 50 years too late. The, demo, the population has been aging and slowing over um, the past 30 or 40 or even 50 years. And, you know, whites just aren't having as many babies as the minority population. That's, that's the fact. So we will have to address diversity one way or the other. Here's a question from um, someone here. Um, I've noticed that the recent TV ads tend to have more diversity in the actors. What's behind this expansion of markets or a purposeful effort to change perspectives uh, across the country? I think it's both. And that's an excellent question. You know, again, diversity started as a business concept, you know, for marketing to different uh, groups when they analyzed that um, you know, there were different markets that were just untapped because we didn't know how to reach them. So it started in that context. 
but I think we've got to prepare people to live in a multicultural society. And it hit me in about 1988, uh, Julian Bond, who's one of my civil rights heroes, heroes was making a, a presentation in Denver and I got a chance to hear him. And he said, the problem with America is we don't understand that we're 4% of the world's population. We're less than 4%. And yet, you know, as an American, and it hit me that, you know, we act like we're the majority and we're not. And uh, so, you know, we've got to be able to live in this global society and technology's brought us all, you know, closer together that, you know, there are most people in the world, the vast majority of people in the world don't look like us. They, you know, they look like me, they're, they're colored, so to speak. And so we've got to understand that uh, and, and learn how to deal with it. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, everything is perfect, but that's just the reality that we're going to have to confront. And businesses, I think, get it. Businesses actually get it, not only from the standpoint, and I think there was a question I'll try and address that was in one of the ones you sent to me. Businesses get it for two reasons. Number one is that in terms of the businesses that I think are going to, that are doing well, not only in this county, but are going to thrive, is that they recognize that having an inclusive workforce is good business, it's just in terms of the way that uh, you treat people. And you also broaden the market. And you also, by attracting people with different backgrounds, are more creative and sustainable as a business. That's a fact. That's a proven fact. So, you know, that's what I think is uh, kind of ahead of us that we just really haven't a, done a good job in keeping up with. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a couple related questions. One is, do you consider class as a part of diversity, like economic class? And then the second question, can you characterize the socioeconomic diversity in Chafee County? Uh, you know, I would say uh, Chafee County uh, is diverse. You know, uh, it depends on how you define uh, diversity. Certainly, we've got more people that live here that uh, want to be outdoors and, are, you know, want the outdoors and, and outdoor recreation, et cetera. So that would be one dimension um, or aspect of diversity. And go back to the first part, Margie, because I think that was a critical question I want to answer. The first part of the question. Um do you consider class as a part of diversity, such as economic class? Yeah, I absolutely do. And I'm gonna get myself in trouble, but you know, we've got a few minutes, so I hopefully I can work my way out of it. But I absolutely do. And I think it's part of the reason that we have the current upset in society. And so in an academic context, I'm gonna treat you all as my class. I would make this statement, and this is where I think that uh, we're a little bit you know, off the mark. In terms of affirmative action, that's one of those things we don't wanna bring up, right? I would make this distinction, and I think more people need to speak out about this, that I have no apologies whatsoever for being admitted to law school back in the mid 70s based on affirmative action where race wasn't the only factor, but they can considered factors like, you know, I'd gone to law school or I'd gone and got my undergraduate degree I was a minority. I'd gotten, um, you know, into the world of work and was rising. And so that's what allowed me to get into the University of Denver College of Law based on an affirmative action uh, measure. My brother had higher L LSAT scores than I did. I had did my LSAT scores were average, but I got admitted to law school. Now, should my two sons be the beneficiaries of affirmative action and have their race be taken into account. Yes, to some extent still, and they should also not be discriminated against on the basis uh, that they're African-American. However, if I have in front of me a white kid from a trailer park who's gonna be the first of his generation to go to college, that white kid deserves the benefit of being admitted to college over a minority, and I'm gonna count my sons in that category. That's where I think we haven't really reflected class in a lot of this, and we're not talking about it, you know. And we and that I think is why you know we have the the current uh, conflict that we have. We're just not talking about what's real, and I think hopefully we're getting to that, and we'll have more open discussion and dialogue. But that's where I think class does need to come into play. You know, my I benefited from affirmative action. I'm responsible for my kids. 
uh, being able to take advantage of that, but not over somebody from a lower class who's going to have the first opportunity to raise him, him or herself up by their bootstraps. So yes, class is, I think, one of the issues that we've got to consider moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see some other questions here we have. Um, somebody asked about uh, businesses uh, in the private and public and um, you know, government businesses in Chafee County. Uh, we know that you spoke at the Salida City Council. Are those um, government businesses as well as private businesses more active in trying to be inclusive and I think that I and I applaud them. I uh, offered to basically uh, talk with them and offer my uh, services at no cost at the beginning of this, you know, last summer, uh, just as a as a resource and both the Buena Vista uh, staff, uh, senior level staff, uh, community foundation board of directors and Salida City Council. I've actually had two, a couple of different uh, sessions with them took me up on that. So I think they're trying to understand the issue. Uh, and, and, you know, we even had some conversation at the county level in terms of, you know, what uh, we might do about it. But just issuing a statement without any action, in my mind, and I hate to be super critical, you know, rings kind of hollow. In other words, there has to be something to back that up. And I, I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, I know we've got issues. Um, uh, in, in certain businesses that maybe have, a, have felt threatened or experienced something, but um, there has to be some leadership and there has to be some uh, strategy or objective that we're trying to uh, accomplish. And right now, you know, my focus would be on assisting the school districts and in, in what it is, you know, they need to do. But I think, I think we're getting there. I think that uh, one of the things I'm proud about this county is that we've got a brain trust of people that I see some of them on the Zoom call that, you know, at the appropriate moment, we'll be happy to kind of step forward and, and offer, you know, their, their support. And, and frankly, this meeting is an example of that, I think. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes. Um, do you want to do some more wrap up and then if we see if we have more questions? I mean, there's a few more, but I yeah, think you know, I'd like to hear more from you. Sure. Um, what was I going to wrap up with? I think um, one of the things that I was going to, oh, a, a couple of things. One is, um, I think that the faith community, you know, has a role in this. I listened uh, about a month ago to a, a um, pastor talk about, you know, faith styles and evangelizing. And I think that's where all of us struggle is, you know, what's my why? What's my role in all of this? And I identified about, you know, the, he identified about six different faith styles that I just want to throw out there that I think are part of what we can be doing individually, you know, as we feel comfortable in talking about the subject. One is an action-oriented direct style, like, uh, which is what you're doing now, of, you know, kind of taking the issue head on. Uh, the other is more intellectual and reasoning. You know, I'd love to get a group that wants to talk about some of the uh, books and material that I've, you know, kind of put out there. Uh, the testimonial, you know, being able to tell your story, which uh, helps people kind of relate to what it is, um, you know, the topic is about. Uh, interpersonal, yeah, which is relational. Somebody just said throw a party, you know, in di celebrating diversity in a lot of organizations, uh, some of the most popular ways of doing that is to basically talk about people's uh, cultures and what foods come, come out of their culture. And I coined this fr uh, phrase a long time ago, that food is the universal language. Everybody speaks food, right? So throw a party and have people bring different foods that represent their culture. And that's always been kind of a starting point in a lot of organizations. Um, invitational as a style to evangelism. And it talks about inviting recklessly, get some people together to, to talk about it. And the people that you know that may be from a different culture, have them talk about their experiences. And then finally serving the, you know, the needs of others. And that's where this is a great community in terms of the, the nonprofit stuff. So let me close with this, and we still have about 10 minutes left. I, I wanted um, for this group, the League of Women Voters, because you do so much for the community, uh, to listen to the speech by Sojourner Truth in 1951, at, or 1851 at the Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio, because I think it's appropriate for kind of the 
the current moment. And you can read about Sojourner Truth, who was a big abolitionist and that kind of thing. And she starts out by saying, well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what all, what, what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could heed me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I crowd out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. Ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What's this they call it? A member of the audience whispers, intellect. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ was the woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world all upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it. The men better let them. Obliged to you for hearing me, and now old Sojourner ain't got nothing more to say. So, you know, um, I think, frankly, we need women to step up and lead in this discussion, not only about race and the current environment they're in, but in a variety of ways. You know, from a public administration standpoint, the women who uh, started these nonprofit organizations back in the 1800s are the ones that basically have helped us create government agencies that took over a lot of that work. A lot of people don't know that history. And I think if there was ever a time for women to kind of lean in, not only the conversation, but the leadership of this country and on this issue, you know, now's the time. So let me close with that. I think we got nine minutes left, uh, Margie. Yes, I had, uh, yes, I had uh, a, another question that came up that's been um, a couple people have supported it. Uh, I mean, the question, uh, how do we, um, address the white supremacist groups. And there is a concern about that applies to even in our county. Um, so as, a, as individuals, as an organization, do you have some recommendations, some thoughts? Well, um, first and foremost, I think it is a law enforcement issue where it may cross that line. I think we need to be listening to one another, um, you know, and, and also, not treat this as just a local problem. You know, it's a, it's a societal wide problem that took many years for us to get here. And, it'll, and I always say, give us half as long as it took to get it back. But we've got to start listening to people uh, and talking about, um, you know, the issue. Uh, but first and foremost, I think, you know, it's a problem for law enforcement to deal with where that line gets crossed. But uh, we've got to open up the dialogue and discussion uh, at some point and listen to people. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we had another question. I think you've given us a lot of good information and information to think about. You, you talked about, um, we said you talked about the books and you'd like to have a chance to be able to discuss some of those. Uh, do you have a, a further idea on that? Do you wanna have a book club? <laughs> Somebody said. Well, you know, I, I think that's your homework, you know, uh, for people to become, you know, more enlightened. I'm just sharing with you the resources that I've used you know, over the years to study up on the subject. And then I, I have a lived experience, uh, you know, of having uh, lived life as an African-American, primarily in this state, but, you know, I grew up on a farm. So, you know, I didn't see color or race per se uh, until I got to high school. Uh, you know, my dad made a point having come out of the South that race was never an ex to be an excuse uh, for not accomplishing what you needed to accomplish. So, um, I, I'd be happy to, you know, lead conversations, but I, and, and treat me more as a resource to the kind of things that, 
uh, you want to do. I know we've gotten uh, one or two elected officials on here or people that are in different groups. I'm happy to, you know, show up and uh, help with my experiences. But this is going to be a long conversation that we're going to have, uh, not only as a, a group here, but as a society and throughout this country. You know, we got a long way to go. And mainly, and I, I didn't want to dwell too much on this, is that we have a long history of racism in this country that is only now you know, coming about. And I think that George Floyd's death was the tipping point because we've become more multiracial and multicultural. It's not going away. And this younger generation gets it. It realizes that, you know, we cannot continue to live these half-truths or untruths in society. So I have a lot of hope for them, you know, kind of uh, figuring this out. I, I, that's a, so okay. I don't, I can't answer that question. I'm just going to be around doing my okay, thing. Okay, that's good. Uh, so another question about our businesses uh, evaluated on their uh, DEI policies or practices? I mean, is there laws? Um, I mean, there certainly are some laws. Maybe you could just highlight a couple of them or for that would affect people in this county that. Yes. Yeah. So uh, great question. Uh, no, they're not evaluated on diversity, equity and inclusion per se. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the Colorado Civil Rights Division enforce the anti-discrimination laws in employment and the Office of Fair Housing enforces fair housing laws. Uh, one of the things that we did in the early civil rights movements going back to the late mid to late 1800s is that we had public accommodation laws uh, in this state. And so those laws are also uh, still enforced. But in terms of diversity, you know, um, you, if you're a public agency, you have to do an analysis annually if you ever take any uh, money from the federal government and try and conform your workforce as best you can to those uh, in the population at large. So that's always uh, been out there. And that was my role as the state civil rights director. But no law per se uh, mandates diversity. But I got to tell you, the businesses that are going to succeed and thrive in this society are all embracing diversity because they recognize, you know, that's the way the population uh, is moving and those are the markets of the future. So, uh, and, and that goes even locally too. A lot of local businesses that are successful here have made their culture embrace this concept of diversity and inclusiveness because they, they get it, so to speak. Okay. Uh, in, here's another question. In public discussion on race and diversity, is it okay to refer to groups as brown, black, non-white, or is that offensive? Or is African-American, Latino, uh, such a more appropriate? Boy, that's a, that's a tough one. I guess it depends on the audience and it depends on what people, you know, are, are comfortable with. Uh, you know, I'm comfortable being referred to as an African-American or black, you know, Negro, is kind of a neutral term, but it's offensive, you know, to uh, uh, some people. But I think it's understanding your audience and how, here's the most important question that goes back to the homework, it's how people identify themselves, right? Uh, I have two sons uh, from my first wife who was Mexican and Native American. I, and one son identifies himself clearly as African-American and black. The other identifies himself as multicultural or multiracial. And so it's getting down to that level of understanding of where people feel comfortable in terms of their own identities. But it, but it is tricky if, uh, for whoever you know, wrote the question, it, it is tricky these days. I always try and come back to, well, what's in their pie? And maybe you know, their identity, their, their racial identity is only one piece of it. Okay, so. Um... Let's see if we have any other questions here. We've had some good questions and um, you've given us an awful lot to think about and appreciate you sharing your time with us this morning and um, putting up with our, uh, our lack of technology uh, professionalism, I guess. Right. <laughs> so we're all in the learning. We can put that in our pie, you know. Right. Uh, that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that technology is still a challenge. <laughs> right. And that, so. Um, um, I'd like to say if anybody else would like to stay on after the presentation, Wendell probably has to get back to work. We appreciate you coming and sharing with us today um, so much. And, uh, but if anybody else would like to stay on afterwards and, and 
visit and find out more about the ask some leak questions or talk with each other. We're happy to do that for, for a little bit. It's different not having in-person meetings as everybody knows, and we kind of get a chance, miss a chance of getting just to visit with each other. So um, Wendell, and you're welcome to stay on too, if um, uh, you'd like to. And we'd like to thank all the people to attending today. We had 47 people and some of those might've been two people in one screen, we don't know. And um, we appreciate all the suggestions that, that people um, have have given that you've given us and that we can um, share. And um, so anyway, thank yep. you. And Karen, anybody else want to say, have anything else to say? Um, just that on our website, the I think I put this on there, the, the state of Colorado has a whole thing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and they have a whole bunch of diverses. And I put a link on there for that. And we will then get Wendell's list of of books and some of those that some of others of you uh, suggested and try to put that link on our website as well. So um, yeah. we had lots of guests. So thank you very much for participating. Yeah, and you know, I tell people this, I told my law enforcement class about this, I'll tell this quick story and kind of wrap up with this. But, um, you know, we I, I had this class my first time teaching my law enforcement group, which tends to be kind of a closed group. And um, I remember I started out on a Friday evening and then we go all day Saturday and they were just not warming up to the subject at all and, and saying much about anything. And then I thought to myself, you know, as professors, you kind of have to think on your feet. I said, I said to them after coming back from a, a break, you know, we've got to talk about this stuff because everybody's got one in their family, right? Everybody's got somebody in their family that's different. And those awkward moments where you just don't know what to say to, or how to approach them. And I told the story about my family picnic. Everybody has a family celebration, right? Where we've been having this picnic for, you know, maybe a dozen years or so. And my cousin's daughter, my, her, her daughter, um, they uh, brought her boyfriend, soon to be husband, to the picnic. And he was a white guy. And so for the first time in my family, this white guy comes up to the picnic and I was ashamed of my family and their inability to accept and react to some, somebody that was different. So everybody's got somebody different who's gay, who's uh, you know of a different ethnicity or race. And it really comes back to just acknowledging that you know we need to honor those uh, differences. So the next time you approach a situation or you look at somebody, ask yourself, what is in their pie? And be curious enough to start uh, asking that question. So anyway, thank you all. And uh, Margie knows how to get a hold of me, and so does Karen. We'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wendell. Bye. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good job. And Margie, I just want to say we had a lot of guests whose names I don't recognize, but I, know. I encourage them to uh, go to our website and check us out. Right. We need to unmute people. Can we do that? Or they? I think everyone has to unmute them. We can unmute ourselves. Oh, good. You know, so. All right. So that was too bad. Didn't have all that technology worked out. But that's that's live and learn. You know, it worked though, Margie. I heard everything that was on the, the videos. It worked just fine. So yeah. um, it was good program. Yeah. yeah, it was excellent. Because I'm right here. I just wanted to throw something out that, you know, it'd be interesting to get his take on. Uh, the fall of 1971 was my freshman year of college and I was enrolled in an experimental sociology class. I was the small town white girl. Uh, we met in the evenings and it was groups of six. So they, of course there weren't very many in Minnesota, very small town diverse people uh, who were mostly all whites, but you know, there was the Catholics versus the Lutherans and that kind of thing. And so they picked um, my group. There was a Jewish person. Um, like I said, I was a small town white girl. There was a black uh, guy from the inner city of Minneapolis. There was a, a black girl from rural areas. And we just sat around and talked, you know, the, we had a, a mediator, much like at the candidating thing. 
And uh, it was really eye-opening for me. I grew up in a town the size of Buena Vista. And uh, so to get exposed to, to the um, all these different minorities and in, in inner city and um, wealthy black kids and uh, the black kids were just totally blown away that I had never ever spoken to a black person in my life and I was 18 years old. They just couldn't get it. And I mean, that might be kind of a nice thing to do in the schools and stuff. I, you know, we could, since we can't meet right now, it's a little hard to do it, but um, it would be interesting to see if that same experimental sort of dialogue groups is kind of what he's talking about finding out from other people's pies. Nice. Good suggestion. Yeah. Might be something we could do at one of our, our opening potluck dinners. We could all bring potlucks from our different background heritages and then we could uh, talk about our first encounters with different races of people or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, like you said, everybody likes to eat, you know, it could come up with all sorts <laughs> of cool food. <laughs> right. I like the pie. Um, did, did, um, did you find it interesting? I mean, he, he had pie that had different um, parts of it, you know, small and large. I thought that was interesting, um, but you, now we can all come up and say, now what's in your pie? And we'll know what we're talking about. <laughs> Somebody else may not know that, right? To say, what, what's in your pie? But I thought that was a good exercise to see what, um, how to yeah, divide I did it up. Too. Because it, it's interesting, you know, to figure out, how, well, how do you really identify yourself, you know? I'm a Norwegian. I didn't, I didn't know Wendell was a. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know Wendell was a big fly fisherman. Karen, did you know that? Yes, I did. That's how, one of the ways we connected when he was first Boys and Girls Club executive director, and thus he connected to the former governor Bill Ritter, who's not now here, and that's why Bill moved. One of the reasons, because they both like to fish. Fish. <laughs> Does when Wendell lives here? Yes, he lives in Slida. Oh wow. Aren't we lucky? That's for about yeah. maybe what, 10 years, 15 years? How long has he been here? Oh, yeah. Well, let's see. He was our first executive director. So that was 2015 or six, 16, maybe. So he's been here quite a while. A little longer than that. Wow, what a resource. Yeah. I would be really interested in, in getting a little book club and reading uh, some of these books he brought up. Yeah, some, some of the leagues have a what they call a, a, a political book club or something where they read topics like that. I mean, they read different kinds. I think Lerner County has one. And um, so I always thought that would be kind of interesting too. Um, but like our book club is reading, somebody mentioned that cast. Yes. And we read... Right. Um, you know how to be an anti-racist kind of how to be an anti-racist mm -hmm. you know so those are kind of interesting anybody else have written some books like that hey margie this is reed um i, uh -huh. just, I was in another zoom meeting last week we got a major environmental organization and they interviewed two women one was a native american and one was a um your average academic, high academic white lady, but there's two books that they talked about and one is called Standoff, it's, uh, Standing Rock, the Bundy Movement and the American Story of Sacred Lands. And um, so, and this is the woman who's a Native American, her name's Jacqueline Keeler. We, maybe you could put it on the list somewhere for other people to look at, but it's, uh, it, it's in, I mean, as Wendell said, racism goes, back even before the founding fathers and the, and the founding of our country. And then there's another book called American Zion, uh, Clive and Bundy, God and Public Lands in the West. And again, what brings this full circle is that, that so, many of the, so many of the attitudes and what's going on with, with um, white supremacy and that kind of stuff, uh, both of these women address this issue and give a pretty good historical perspective that goes back a lot farther than just the last 20 or 30 years. And it was interesting today, I just got an email from the Nature Conservancy and their thing was about 
racism in their organization and how we should go to some of the national parks or national monuments that support black history to learn more of that side of it. I'm, I haven't finished it yet, but uh, CAST, I think does a really thorough job of looking at um, where we where we're coming from and how it reflects that reflects itself in everything that happens in today's culture. Yeah, it's good. We have a, a group um, that is open to anybody at the church, and we've been uh, doing book studies and a lot of them are on all oh, just very different things but we've had books um that we've worked with on uh racism and some on gender um transgender kind of issues um and you know um it's the ucc church and anybody is welcome so um, right now we're doing it on Zoom and we just <laughs> finished up um, how to, the acting against racism was, was uh, what we were doing. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of groups around for discussing this issue for sure. Right. I have to ask Judy how her knee is. She got a new knee. <laughs> My new knee is is wanting to be a part of the, the part of the whole deal. Finally, yeah, okay. it's been fine. Good. I might mention some some leak things next. Um, I think it's the eleventh. I should check the date. Um, but the league has got a, a program. It's free. It's uh, they're making democracy work. Um, award they're giving to three um, um, recipients and they've videotaped the whole thing and they said the interviews with the people are just phenomenal and so it's it's worth um, um, signing in and, and seeing and I think it's like at 5 30 next Wednesday night maybe um, it's on the state league website and I'm, I'm signed up to see it but I think it's next week maybe it's this week I don't know I've I'm still um, don't have that in front of me right now, so I don't remember. But anyway, it would be good for some of you to might enjoy seeing it. And there's also the state convention. Um, anybody's welcome to go to that. It's free this year, so that's that's always good. And um, um, there's other there's the league is also doing training. If you're interested in the fair maps, the redistricting, how to be an observer for that and see what's happening. There's some discussion because the Census Bureau will not be able to meet the deadlines, what was sent in the constitution when it was ratified, uh, you know, passed by the voters last year. I think it was a July 1st deadline. I don't have the dates in front of me. And they're afraid that Census Bureau won't be able to meet those, um, that criteria. So what they're gonna do about that. But there is a way that you can be on part of the observer core and watch what's going on and keep tabs. Everybody's gonna be able to uh, it's going to be open to the public, and you can offer maps and your ten, two cents worth. Uh, there's some other. Um, there's a clean um, a, a, a climate task force that's meeting, and um, one of our members, uh, Sandy Long, is involved with that. But they anybody can be interest, you know, can be become involved with that also, and they're doing that. They're also looking for anybody that's interested in any legislation that you want to help with the legis legislative action committee, you can even testify in front of a, 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 house, dis a house committee if you want to via Zoom. So they're asking people and they're training people what some of the top priorities are uh, for this year that the league will be uh, working towards. And um, they, they're sending out, they've sent out, um, you know, when you get the president's um, newsletter or e-voter, that tells you a lot of that. There's another um, topic that um, they're working on. So I'm still kind of, I didn't get that. Just before everything happened, my complete computer screen went black and shut down. 
Oh, and no. so, I mean, this was like oh. at 1125. <laughs> I'm still kind of like, ah. And so I then had to, so Wendell had texted me and I said, oh, I'll be on pretty soon. <laughs> I had this problem. So I had to reload it, rebook it, boot it up. And so that's why it kind of gave me a, you know, I didn't seem as calm and collected as I thought I should be because I had all this ah! <laughs> going on at the same time. So anyway, I'm glad it happened to me and nobody else. <laughs> Good. Good. And Margie and everybody also, if you go to our website and the League of Women Voters Colorado website, but I'll try to put a link on this. Um, there's a two-part program on beyond polarization that the league yes. is doing. Yes. Um, you have to register. I think it's five bucks a night. I think it's uh, February 24th and maybe March 3rd. I know I signed up for that. Yes. So I'll try to put a link on, too, the on that one. The, uh, the redistricting is Observer Corps, if you're interested in the redistricting, that is uh, the 22nd at 5.30 and it's free to, to sign up for. They just ask you to sign up, uh, register in advance is what they're doing. And um, the other thing that we've decided, we had a board meeting the other day, but we said, we're not going to work on a newsletter anymore. We're just going to send out a little email that'll say, you know, because we've got everything on the website. We have what's happening on the website, what the dates are, how to register and all that. So uh, we're not going to be doing an e-voter newsletter. We'll just send out a, a, a notice that says, you know, the program and the program next month is going to be the county commissioners, the three county commissioners are going to be presenting uh, via Zoom. And that's always a popular meeting. And if you have questions you want to ask in advance, you can send them to me or Karen and we'll see that they get some of them in advance and then they'll be able to ask some via chat also. Um, does anybody have any comments on how this worked today? I mean, this is kind of, we asked some of the chat questions. Um, we had some questions in advance. Do you have any recommendations on improving it for next time? I'd be interested in hearing how some of our guests learned about this. And I put my email, I'm the membership chair in the chat and we are going to have a letter writing thing encouraging our legislators to sit across the aisle and talk to people they don't know. So if you're interested in hearing about that, you can email me. Good. Yeah, that, that came out of the Gunnison League that they want to encourage the, our state and federal legislators to take a day or some time to actually sit with somebody from the other party. Uh, and that would be a way of becoming more inclusive, right? They might learn to be how to get along with pe people better. So that's something that we'll be sending out. Um, yeah, we're spending money on advertising on the newspaper. So we assume that that's working. If some of you people learned about it some other way, we'd like to know that. We'd like to know how to reach people. Uh, if the newspaper ads are doing the work, then we're happy to do that. Uh, we send it out to our members and people who sign up for our, our newsletter, our, our email things. So anybody else have any comments on that? When people sign in as a guest, can can it be can there be something put in with that that says how did you hear about us? Mm, no, they no that when they sign up to be a member, they can, and they can sign up to get our quote newsletter, which is really an email um, yeah. first for a while to check us out um, without becoming a member. Membership is $55 a person and 83 for a household. And you belong to the state and the national with that amount. Right, and you get all the information from them. Um, I was just gonna go here. Marilyn, you, Marilyn Bolden, you said that you uh, had gone to the county commissioners and, and, and part of something, another organization and our, our do you want to tell us briefly about that? Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, hear you. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we did approach the uh, county commissioners, Andrea Carlstrom, the director of public health, and I, on behalf of our senior master planning committee, to request support from the commissioners to apply to become an AARP age friendly community which is a national um, movement as well as a statewide uh, 
initiative, the statewide is called Colorado, Lifelong Colorado, um, to promote communities um, supporting healthy aging, basically. And so they did agree to support that. And we're in the process right now of applying formally to the AARP for that designation. And really that's going to be just a way for us to be more aware of some issues with um, older adults. By the way, that's the um, term that we are encouraged to use rather than seniors um, to make Every aspect, there's eight domains if you're interested on getting on the AARP website, but there's eight domains that this age-friendly community initiative uh, addresses and all the way from policy changes to identifying services and, and programs related to uh, possible ageism issues. So I think maybe that would be a good topic at some point for the league. Uh, we could talk a little bit about ageism. There is another movement in the state called Changing the Narrative, um, Reframing Aging. And so there's a group uh, statewide that's working on some of these really important issues. So you're gonna be hearing more and more about that, I think, because we're all aging. <laughs> Luckily. So once we get approved to be an age-friendly community, there'll be some more publicity coming out. Um, and uh, there's a 13 uh, communities in the state of Colorado who have already started on this path and we can join their network and learn from them as well. This, this is Alan. Maybe I can contribute a little bit to that, that I, as many of you are, are I'm participating in the development of a, of a countywide uh, community recreation plan that has many elements, but one of the, one of the topics that they're, they're dealing with is, 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 is how to make recreation and recreation access more, more appropriate more available to to older sorry older older adults um, and it's it's one of many many other topics but I, I think it it's it's consistent with the with with what uh, Marilyn has just been talking about so I, I, I may I may try to get a bit more information and make sure the people who are directing this community recreation planning are, are aware of some parallel movements like like you've just described thanks I, Wendell just sent me his um, list of resources, so I'm going to post it here. Hello. We'll post it on our website, too. Yes. Jean, are you talking? Yeah. Did everybody see? I posted on the chat room there. Yeah, yeah Carol, do you want to talk about uh, uh, Great Decisions? Uh, okay, we had our first session a couple weeks ago, and Thursday is our second discussion, and uh, Cecilia at the library has been very good at promoting, and, and um, so we've, we had quite a few in attendance last time. I'm trying to think of how many at least maybe 10, 15 or something. But uh, the Zoom meetings are coming along. It's not as easy as sitting in a circle and talking, but uh, it's still going strong after 10 years, I think it has been 20. There were, there were a lot of new 20. people. Let yes, and those are all from, uh, a lot of them from the library. And then friends of friends and so uh, I was going to look and see the. Uh, do you know right offhand what the topic is for this coming? Yes, week? it's the Persian Gulf and something security. Okay. And uh, I'm just about ready to send out a, a reminder, and I have been putting, and we'll put again the the 
Chaffee County League of Women Voters uh, website as a link to check us out. Good. Libby, anything exciting you want to tell us about the town? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we last week we acquired uh, some land north of Buena Vista. The reason we bought the land is that we wanted the water rights. Um, but we ended up uh, buying this land, it's 103 acres, and uh, it includes a house and um, a nearby structure that also could provide some housing and um, water rights that are almost as much in water rights as what we have right now. Wow. So really yeah. great acquisition. And- um, Who owned the property? Um, a, a couple whose last name is Hogg, H A Hogg, Happy Hogg, yeah. Haug. Okay. H A U. Who was it, Karen? Ron and Kathy Haug. Okay. Heather's mom. So um, we have our water engineers working on it right now to evaluate the the water rights, and uh, we'll you know we we have the right to back out of the contract if the water rights are not what what we think they are. But it's really a big deal. We have not bought any water rights since 1988, so so it's a huge a huge uh, uh, acquisition for us in terms of water rights. The money is about uh, one million three hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, and we have that money in our water fund available. We've been we've been collecting uh, money with the idea of being able to buy water rights. So, um, so that's what that's what we're doing. There's also another interesting um, project that's going to be on a work session tomorrow, which is uh, just west of West Winds on uh, County Road 306, Main Street, and it's it's a very interesting looking project. You may want to take a look at it um, if you look at our packet for tomorrow night's meeting. Uh, we're having a work session about this development and it, it looks great. Um, it, would, it would add about 64 apartments, which would be really nice for, you know, pe for affordable housing. So um, you could, uh, you know, take a look at that and feel free to participate in the work session as well. So those are exciting things happening at the town. Yeah, they are. So yeah, and if any of you have questions to submit to the county commissioners in advance, um, you know, uh, send them to, to me or Karen, and we'll make sure that um, we'll get those um, to them. And then, of course, we'll be able to have some other questions via chat. Uh, Karen just made the announcement that we have another new member after this presentation, so that's very good. I have to get ready to go get my second COVID shot, so I am going to depart and. We just got ours. I got mine this morning. <laughs> okay, good. It was you very, guys are the Pfizer people. I got it organized. Well, you just probably took like half yeah. an hour. I was going to ask if everybody's got their shots. Yeah. Somebody's yeah, phone is ringing. Off. So, All right, we're going to sign off. Fine. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for coming. Yeah. Thank you, guests. It was Thank a great you. meeting. Very good. Very yeah. good. Good, good meeting. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Margie, so um, we need to get together to discuss. Copy that slide or something and send it to me, and I'll put it up there with my other stuff. Okay, and you can, you've got the recording then. Yes, I have to stop the recording. All right, I'm stopping recording. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Uh,